How many of you are familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, either the books or the movies? <laughs> Some of you? Yeah, oftentimes on those things, I just watched the movie. I did actually read the books of the Chronicles of Narnia when I was younger. But in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, there's a character whose name is Aslan, and he's a lion. A and this lion in the Chronicles of Narnia it represents God. And so there's details about him. For instance, he sang the world into existence. So in the Bible, we read how God spoke the world into existence. And as the author C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, he, he was kind of having different things represent truths of the Christian life. And so Aslan sang the world into existence. Aslan also dies, and then he comes back to life to save one of the characters in the story named Edmund. But throughout the Chronicles of Narnia, in several of the books, a, a character will mention that Aslan is not a tame lion. And, and when you think about it, and we think about that applying to God, that, that's really a profound statement. That there's truth that is worth thinking about there. Because do you ever try to tame God? And again, I know the church answer is, no, of course I don't try to tame God. But as we come and as we listen to God's word, we should be ready to have God convict us of sin and show, show us places where we might tame God in our own lives. And we want God to show us those things so that we can bring those things to, to him and say, God, this is a problem I have. Would you forgive me and would you help me with it? And so with that in mind, as we focus on this story that Erica just read, I want to think through if there are ways that we try to tame God. Because in this account, we learn about two groups of people who tried to tame God. And it didn't end very well for either of them. The first group of people who tried to tame God was the Philistines. Or, sorry, First group was the Israelites, second group was the Philistines, we'll get there. First group was the Israelites. So the Israelites are going up in battle against the Philistines, one of their enemies that are in kind of the surrounding area. And they go against the Philistines in battle, and they lose. And so they wonder what's happening. They're wondering why God made them lose this battle. And they say, wait, I have an idea. Here's how we can go into battle and be sure that we're going to win. And so they say, we should go get the Ark of the Covenant. And hopefully you remember from last year what the Ark of the Covenant is, as we went through that in a few sermons last year. But you'll remember that as the Israelites were traveling from Egypt to the Promised Land, God had commanded them to make basically this big tent called the Tabernacle that served as the Temple. And it was portable, so they were able to move it from place to place as they traveled. And that tabernacle had two different rooms in it. The first one was the holy place, where priests would enter on a daily basis and perform certain duties as they worshipped God. But the second room was called the Holy of Holies. And that was where only the high priest could enter only once every year. And he would come and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, it was called, of this Ark of the Covenant. And the reason he was only able to enter once per year was because God, had, God was present in a special way, connected to this Ark of the Covenant. As some authors can refer to it as being God's throne seat. That that was where God's presence was there in a special way. And so people could not just approach God's presence as they were sinful and he was holy. They weren't allowed to just come in there. But instead, God allowed the high priest to once a year, in a very specific way, come in there. And so that was the Ark of the Covenant. God's presence was attached to it in a special way. And so the Israelites decide, you know what, let's bring that Ark of the Covenant into battle. Uh, then surely we will win this battle. And so they do that. They bring it into battle. But instead of winning the victory, instead they lose in a terrible way. 30,000 
of their soldiers are killed in this battle. And then if you remember from last week, the, the priest Eli who had these sons who really were bad priests, who were really disrespectful to God, that Hophni and Phinehas, they also die in this battle. And the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. So they've lost the battle. They've lost the Ark of the Covenant. And then just kind of wrapping up the story from last week. Remember, the message that God gave to Samuel was that God was going to bring judgment against Eli and his sons. And so Eli, he hears about how bad the battle went. He hears that his sons died. And then he hears that the Ark of the Covenant was stolen. And and he knows how bad that is. And in response, he, he falls backwards in his seat and breaks his neck and dies. So we see God's judgment that was predicted come on Eli's house. But what happened in this situation? Why didn't it work to bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle? Well, you could say that the Israelites were trying to tame God. They thought that they could just command God to do what they wanted him to do. Considering that they lost that first battle, we can probably assume that at that time in their history, they really were not serving God. Likely they were serving and worshiping other gods, but they also kind of still believed in the one true God, and they thought, you know what, we're having trouble, let's bring him in to help us. And so they thought that they could use God like a good luck charm. But God in this situation made it very clear that he would not be their pet. God would not be their genie. God will not be be tamed. Do you try to tame God? As we look around, maybe there's some obvious examples we can see of this. Maybe if you ever watch some of the preachers on TV, sometimes they'll even try to sell some kind of holy water from Israel. That you, you order a little vial of it, you get water that comes from Israel, and it's supposed to do something special for you. That'd be one example of trying to tame God, saying this water is going to do something special when the Bible says nothing about it. That'd be one example. But there's probably less obvious examples that that we fall into sometimes. Maybe some of you have seen either Facebook messages or or emails that they're forwarded to a bunch of people, and, and they'll say something about God, and then they'll say, and if you forward this to all your friends, you will be blessed. And so there's this idea, if I can just kind of do this, if I can forward it to other people, then I'm going to be blessed. And that seems like a way we try to tame God. Basically kind of making up ways that we can make God bless us. Or maybe this one will hit closer to home. This one you hear more often. You'll hear people say, you know what? I notice that my week just goes better when I go to church. Or maybe it's, I notice that my day goes so much better when I do my devotions. And if I don't do my devotions, my day is just uh, in trouble. And now as we say that, if our idea is that church helps my week because it helps bring my focus to God for the week, then that's great. That's the right understanding. But sometimes it's worded kind of like it's this good luck charm. I went to church and now my week's going to go smooth. It's going to go how I want it to go. And so the focus is on us instead of the focus being on God. We also do the same thing with Bible verses. Uh, Philippians 4.13, a lot of you are probably familiar with it. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that verse should be an encouragement to us. But how is it often used? You'll see football players quoting this verse for why they're going to win the football game. You see people quote this verse for why they're going to be successful in this area of their life or that area of their life. Have you ever read what was going on in Paul's life when he wrote this verse? He was talking about how he had learned to be content in all circumstances. He had learned to be content when he had plenty of food and when he didn't have enough. 
in the good times and in the bad times. And so that verse is about how God will help us through difficult times as we serve him. But instead we make that verse about us and about getting things that we want and about our lives being comfortable. And so we try to tame God. And we make following Jesus about us living the good life instead of about us serving him. Then there's Romans 8, 28, which says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And again, that should be a wonderful encouragement to us. But so often, our idea of what is good for us is different than God's idea of what is good for us. And so we have this idea that God, again, is going to make our lives successful. He's going to make our lives comfortable. When often he's more concerned about making us more like him and making us depend on him more. The same could be said of that statement, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He, he absolutely does have a wonderful plan for your life. But it's probably not the wonderful plan that you have. Sometimes we try to tame God with worship music. Music because of, it makes us feel a certain way. And in some churches, there's kind of even been this battle over new music and old music. And both sides are kind of arguing because they like one style of music better than the other. And so worshiping God, focusing on God, instead becomes about focusing on yourself and your experience. we probably do this with confirmation classes sometimes. If I can just get my grandson through confirmation classes, then God will let, have to let them into heaven. And yeah, they might turn away from him the rest of their life, but at least they got through confirmation. And so we try to tame God. We make confirmation into a good luck charm. Or we do that with communion. And maybe I've got, maybe I'm off on this, but I've gotten the sense from some of you at times, that you really want your relatives who aren't really following God, you really want them here at services on Christmas, on Easter, so that they can have communion. And don't get me wrong, that communion is a beautiful gift from God as we receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. But if you're bringing your relatives who are not walking with the Lord, hoping that somehow it's going to be a good luck charm for them, you're trying to tame God and it's not going to work. Instead, God says that for those people, instead they're taking judgment on themselves. Taming God doesn't work. Sometimes, I've definitely heard my youth say this, They'll say, don't say that in church. And it's this idea that you can say certain things outside of church, but don't say it in church. And there's probably the adult version of those types of statements, too, that we behave differently here than out there. Like somehow God doesn't see us out there. And so we try to tame God. And this can be the case even when we pray for people when they're sick. It definitely God invites us to pray for people. He invites us to pray for healing. But often, we can be ignoring God the rest of our lives, but then suddenly someone gets sick, and it's time, to, it's time to pray. Or you'll see even statements in common culture where people who don't even seem to have a faith in God say, we're sending our thoughts and prayers to you, whatever that means. And so suddenly, prayer becomes a good luck charm to trick God into healing someone we care about. And in all of this, we end up treating God like a vending machine. You know the ones where you push, you, you see the candy bar you want, and it's got a number next to it. So like B6. So you push button B, and then you push, push button 6, and you receive what you want to from the vending machine. And we start to think that if we just push God's buttons right, he'll give us what we want in our lives. I scratch God's back, he'll scratch mine. And so is your faith about you and a comfortable life, getting what you want from God? Or is your faith about God 
and his glory? Do you try to tame God? The Israelites tried to tame God, and 30,000 of them died because God will not be tamed. So that's the first group of people that tried to tame God, the Israelites. Then the second group is the Philistines. You see, the ark was captured in that battle, and the Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant to one of their temples, where one of their main gods, they worshiped many gods, but one of their main gods was in this temple, this statue named Dagon. And so they bring the Ark into the temple, and this was a common practice in battles at that time, because it was kind of the idea that, see, our God was more power, or our gods were more powerful than your gods, was kind of the idea. And so they would bring the enemy statues or their idols or whatever into the temple of their God. So they thought that their God had ta- tamed the Israelite God. He had defeated him. But they didn't understand that the reason the Philistines were victorious was not because their God, Dagon, was so powerful. No, instead, The one true God had fought against his own people because they tried to tame him. But even as the Philistines bring the Ark of the Covenant into this temple, God shows that he will not be tamed. You see, the next morning, their idol, this statue, Dagon, has fallen on his face in front of the Ark, like he's bowing down to it. Uh, And so they pick it up, they put him back where he belongs, and then leave it for another night. And then they come back, and they find that he's fallen down again the next morning. And this time, it says his head and his hands were also cut off. And again, that was common practice in battle. You might remember David and Goliath. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. But after David killed Goliath, he cut off his head. That was a common thing in battle as you showed that you were victorious. And so here God is showing that he is victorious over their false god. That their god, Dagon, has no power. God is showing that he will not be tamed. Are there enemies, or I'm sorry, are there idols in your life that need to bow down before God? You see, the Philistines viewed the God of the Israelites as just one of many gods. They, and so how the Philistine religion worked was they worshipped certain gods to help them with certain things. And sometimes we kind of do the same thing. When you try to tame God, you only let him be in charge of certain parts of your life. You worship him when you think it will be helpful to you but then you worship other things in practice instead of him when they seem more beneficial to you. So examples could be your family, your job, money and stuff, friendships and activities, relaxing and watching TV. All of those things that can be good things. But do you end up bowing down to them? Believing that those things can somehow give you what you truly want in life. Notice how the Philistines, after this happens, you'd think they'd say, oh, I I guess our God isn't powerful. Maybe we should worship this Israelite God. Look how powerful he is. But they don't do that. They stubbornly continue to worship their false God. And again, we do the same thing. These gods, all these things we can chase after in life, all these things we end up worshiping with our lives. So often they leave us empty. So often they leave us realizing that they don't fulfill us. But we stubbornly continue to worship them. We stubbornly continue to chase after more and more and more, hoping that somehow they'll satisfy when only Christ will satisfy us. And as we see in this account, God doesn't share his glory. God won't be tamed. So along with this, along with their idol bowing down 
to the Ark of the Covenant. God also gave the people in, these Philisti- in the Philistine city and the surrounding area, he gave them tumors okay, as a punishment for having the Ark there. And so they say, well, I guess it's a bad idea for us to have this Ark in this city. Let's pass it on to another city. And so they do that, and God strikes that city with tumors. And then they pass it on to another city, and God strikes that city with tumors and and kills some of the people. And so finally they say, we can't keep the Ark of the Covenant in our country. Let's send it back to Israel. And so both the Israelites and the Philistines learned that you cannot tame God. And then even once the ark was returned to Israel, as the Israelites had it now, God struck 70 Israelite men dead because they didn't respect the ark of the covenant how they had been commanded to. And after this incident, after those 70 men are struck dead by God, that's when they ask this question that I've been referring to throughout the service. In 1 Samuel 6.20, they say, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And this is such an important question. Because you see, they have realized now that God cannot be tamed. And what can they do when God, is su- when God suddenly strikes 70 of them dead? They can't protect themselves from a powerful God like this. What chance do they have? The answer is that they don't have a chance. And neither do you. You see, when God struck all those people dead because of how they handled the Ark of the Covenant, God wasn't just having a crabby day. He didn't just lose patience one time. God wasn't just being the mean God of the Old Testament and then we get the nice God in the New Testament. No, God was giving them the punishment that they rightly deserved. In our minds, it seems a bit over the top, doesn't it? But it's a reminder of how serious it is to be in the presence of God as sinful people. God was giving them the punishment that they deserved. It wasn't over the top. It wasn't too harsh. They had rebelled against God, and they had dishonored him. And the punishment they gave there is also what you deserve. You have tried to tame God. but You have made your faith about yourself instead of about Him. You have not treated Him with the respect that His holiness and His power deserve. God could strike you dead at any moment and you would deserve it. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. Before this holy God who cannot be tamed, you don't have a chance. So after they ask this question, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Then the people of that Israelite city decide to have another city come and get the ark from them. They don't want it to be around anymore. And you'll even remember how the Philistines, they kept passing it from city to city because they were fearful of the presence of God. When God showed his power and holiness, when he punished people for not handling the ark correctly, the response was that they wanted to get it away from them. Running is a natural response to danger, isn't it? Getting away from the danger is our natural response to danger. And in God's presence, we are in danger. That is a reason that you see people running from God. But no matter how far you run, one day you will be in the presence of God. And God, the just judge, as you stand before him, will either send you to hell or he will send you to heaven, where you will be in his presence forever. So as you stand before God, the judge. There's no way at that point that you're going to tame him. 
you won't be able to offer him a trade. You won't be able to misquote a Bible verse. You won't be able to say a special prayer or promise to attend church a little more often. You see, you're not going to fool God. All the ways that you have tried to tame God throughout your life will be absolutely and completely useless. And so where does that leave us? What chance does that give us? Well, you see, here is the crazy thing. This holy God who cannot be tamed wants you to live in his presence forever. How can this be? How can, it, how can a holy God let sinful people like you and me, disobedient, rebellious people, spend eternity in his presence, looking at his glory? How can that be? Remember, he is not a tame God. And so in order to save us, he did something that seems wild. It seems reckless. It definitely was not tame. This God sent Jesus to walk in the presence of sinners. We cannot be in the holy presence of God, but God came down and walked in the presence of sinners. And then God died to save those sinners. And so understand this. But when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't tame God's wrath. He didn't make God softer on sin. No, all of God's wrath, all of his judgment, all of his punishment for all of your sin was put on Jesus. God's wrath wasn't tamed. It was just put on Jesus instead. And so when we understand this, how can we make our faith, how can we make our lives about ourselves? How can we try to tame God for our purposes? Our faith, our life is all about the one who has saved us in such an incredible and amazing way. Christ took all the punishment that you deserve for all of your sins. All the sins you have committed and all the sins that you will commit. And if you're believing in Jesus here today, and I should say, if you're believing in Christ here today, there could be some people here even now who have attended church many times but realize you've been trying to tame God. You've never really understood how serious your relationship with God was. You've never understood how serious your sin was to God. And so God is inviting you now to trust in Christ and what he did to save you. Because as you believe in Jesus, then you don't have to worry that God is saving some punishment for you later on. Because all of that punishment was placed on Christ. And you will continue to sin every day. But you don't have to fear being the, in the presence of our holy God. Instead, you can know that you are perfect because Jesus, that God sees you as perfect because Jesus was perfect for you. That is how you are able to stand before a holy God. And so then when you think of standing in the presence of God, you don't need to fear anymore. Instead, you can have complete confidence. You can have joy as you stand before God. And know that one day in heaven, you will be in God's complete, beautiful, glorious presence. And as we are in his presence, that is what will truly satisfy us forever. And so by ourselves, God's presence should be a very fearful thing. But in Christ, God's presence will be a beautiful thing for those who believe. Amen.